Hello, boys and girls. RF Blackstone here with another author interview. Today, actually, I'm really excited about this this one. This is with one of the most prolific authors who's put out, who in five years put out 50 books. He's now up to 60. It is, of course, the author of the Z Burbia series, the Rogue Intergalactic Bounty Hunter series, and Max Rage Intergalactic Badass. I'm talking about the one and only Jake Bible. I hope you enjoy the interview because, honestly, I had a fuck ton of fun giving the interview and thanks jake for coming on it's a pleasure to talk to you <laughs> yeah thanks for having me on i appreciate it this is great fantastic so okay you are probably one of the most prolific authors out there at the moment you've got over 60 books published so first question how crazy are you <laughs> <laughs> Um, on, on the outside, I pr I'm probably look pretty sane. <laughs> Everything going on, I'm pretty crazy. In internally, um, internally, I probably have at least a dozen projects simmering in my head at all times. Um, I've gotten good over the years at um, pushing the next project to the top of that pot. So uh -huh. it's simmering up there and I can see it. Um, so I've, I've gotten good at, at prioritizing which project, projects my brain and imagination have to um, pay attention to. But there are times where it all mashes together. And I truly, honestly think I'm thoroughly insane because <laughs> <laughs> the ideas just start turning into this glob. And um, trying to think gets interesting at times. <laughs> it's, it's the curse of being creative, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah, it's it's one of those things. It never stops. It's a 24-7 thing. I mean, it's yep. all day, all night, dreams, reality, whatever, all week long. Once you become a writer or creator, um, I don't know if you can ever really turn it off. You might be able to go on vacation and be on a beach and enjoy waves and surf and all that. But you know, you're sitting there drinking a beer, enjoying the sun an idea is going to hit you or the fix to a problem is going to hit you. Your brain is constantly, your subconscious is always working. Always. Oh, well. Never stops. Yeah. I can, I can attest to that. You're preaching to the <laughs> choir. I mean, my honeymoon back in 2017, I went to Acapulco and the hotel I was staying out in the, out in the middle of the um, bay was this island, a random rock formation island kind of thing. I was looking at it and it just hit me. That could be a kaiju. So, you know, instead of being with my newly, you know, my, my new wife, it was that situation of, okay, got to get this down. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. No, the, no, the notes app on my iPhone is probably my most important tool I have in my life is because when those ideas or thoughts hit, I just have to jot down a note instantly. Um, that way I can, A, it's saved <laughs> and I yep. don't forget it because you will, no matter... No matter who you are, you will forget that idea. It's going to happen. You may remember it, but it could be weeks, months, years later. <laughs> but so you get it down and be by getting it down, it slows the throttle on the subconscious a little bit. So it's like, it's there. I can get to it when I can get to it. I can continue with life right now. <laughs> <laughs> and is that, is that the biggest problem with being so prolific is finding the time to tackle all of the projects that you want to do? Oh yeah. No, I'll die before I get through my list of ideas. I, I just, honestly, there isn't enough time and it's, you know, and I'm not just writing novels. I've got short stories. Um, I, you know, working on the podcast, I'm working on audio dramas and some other projects that haven't even been announced or coming out. I'm definitely looking towards video games because hey. video games, let's face it, uh, the video game market, the revenue from video game market is more than all of the other entertainment, including sports combined. That's <laughs> so it's like, Damn. you know, if I can figure out how to get a little, 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 little <laughs> piece of that, I'll be pretty happy. So yeah, I'll, I'll probably never get to everything I want to <laughs> before okay. I kick it. Yeah. So what? <laughs> Roke is going to come. It, is it? I'm pronouncing that right. Roke or is it Roke? Roke. Yep. Roke. Yeah. Roke's going to go to video games. 
Well, that eventually that would be awesome. Right, right now I'm, I'm focusing on stuff I can tackle like more story based. Okay. Um, you know, not necessarily choose your own adventure, but maybe some things with some choices in there, some simple graphics with a lot more text based okay. stuff. Um, you know, that's my wheelhouse. I'm, I'm not a programmer. I'm, you know, not a game developer or anything like that. Um, so finding um, software that is simple has been, you know, a lot of research into that. Something where I can just get to it and I don't have to learn an entire new language. <laughs> I have a hard enough time with English as it is. So. Oh, come on. You, it, can't, it can't be that bad. Uh, you know, at least you're not an Australian dealing with it. <laughs> yeah, well, there's there's that. Although, here's the thing. I, I grew up in Oregon, and um, something I've learned about Oregon, <laughs> the English language there, is um, our syntax is slightly different, and um, we have what is called resting asshole voice. Um <laughs> So we always sound like we're sarcastic dickheads, pretty much, <laughs> even when we're trying to be sincere. Like and Australians. Okay, so, no, we're, so, so yeah. we're related. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I mean, at least you don't get the problem I get where I have some editors send back, you know, a manuscript and it's just all changing all the Australian spelling into oh, yeah. American spelling. That That's kind of like, oh, it doesn't matter. <laughs> yeah. Or like, for example, the latest book, I've got some, I've got my main characters are Australian, so I'm, I've used a lot of Australian slang. There you go. And, you know, Savage Press put it out, but the editor had a lot of questions about what the hell language is this? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's funny. So they were probably, so you were using an American editor, I would guess. Probably. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Because Severed is, is Australian. You know, so yep. <laughs> they wouldn't have a problem with it, but yeah, I can, I can totally see that. I um the one thing I get all the time is I spell gray with an e g r e y I don't spell it American with a with an a and that's just because growing up in my house we we drink I mean you know, in the Pacific Northwest of the United States coffee is king that is where Starbucks started that is I mean coffee rules but it's also very much because there's nine months out of the year, so much rain. It's a hot beverage place too. So I've been drinking tea since I was little. Okay. Earl Grey is spelled with a Y. Yeah. I have always spelled it with a Y. I even had, you know, high school teachers would, you know, mark it and go A. And I'm like, yeah, but it's spelled both ways. You know that, right? Uh, <laughs> so I've had editors come back and change it. And I'm yep. like, no, I want the E because that's how I say it. I don't care. <laughs> yep. And there's a lot of people reading it who are A, are never going to notice, but B, are like, that's how you spell it. Of course, it's got an E in there. <laughs> so, yeah. Oh, yeah. No, I've got, I've got, I've got all the, that exact same problem at times. So when did you get to the point of being able, you know, like with your self-confidence as a writer, be able to say, no, don't change it. Keep it the way I want it. Ooh. <laughs> okay. <laughs> So let's, 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 there's a couple stages in there. Um, I was, I, I would say I was mistakenly arrogant in the beginning of my novel writing career. And I've gone back and read some of those and gone, oh yeah, that wasn't the best choice. I was probably just being a jerk and putting my foot down over nothing. Cause that, that initial ego you have when you're starting off as a writer can get bruised real fast. Oh yes. You, you haven't learned to put on your armor. You haven't, you haven't made your armor yet. And um, so any change just felt like, you know, it, it was a personal attack. Um, so I could say the first few manuscripts, probably the first three or four manuscripts um, that I had published when I got those edits back, I was, I would just be livid. Um, and I, I had to learn to calm down, take a day, take two days before responding, reread it, read it over again and go, oh, I see. Yeah, that does make sense. That is a good change. <laughs> so honestly, it took, it took a lot of time and experience to get out of the, hey, you don't touch my manuscript <laughs> 
and then get to a point where it's like, okay, I'm going to trust this and trust this. And then it took a few manuscripts later where I realized that editor was wrong. <laughs> As okay. I got more experience, then I was like, no, that, that was a wrong call. That was, I shouldn't have agreed to that. Um, so it was, it was a bit, it, it, it was a wave <laughs> okay, so of starting with, you don't change a thing <laughs> to, oh yeah, you might be right to back to kind of a nice medium level of, okay, I agree with that one or I don't care about that one, that's fine. No one's going to know that there was any change to, no, this has to be this way because you see, and then be able to puke out four paragraphs of explanation. <laughs> so the editor's like, okay, okay, you're right. You got it. I, I get it. It's like, all right, cool. <laughs> so okay. yeah, multi, multi-stage process. <laughs> and, and that seems to be how it is with you in general with your writing and with your with all the series you've put out it does seem to have that multi-stage thing is that yeah. just your personality or is it just random yeah no no i th- i i think that is my personality um somewhat i tend to dive right into things you know just full force um the word aggressive has been used to describe me before um, some people say arrogant, but I prefer aggressive. <laughs> Just go with that. Um, <laughs> but you know, so yeah, it's it's um, it's yeah, it's 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 partially kind of my personality. Then there's also, I don't know, it's <laughs> again, yeah, it's 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 multi staged, and it also uh, depends on the project. There, there are certain things where I'm so invested in there that I can, I don't see how I'm behaving or how I'm approaching it, or I can't see myself anymore. Yep. Um, I'm just in there and whatever behavior happening, the way I interact with people during that is, is how it is. And then there's, there's other things where it's a lot easier to be able to pull back and, um, you know, kind of say, okay, you know, this, this is a good thing for my career. This is a good project. This is what I need to do, but I should probably set it aside, focus on this first, go with that. And it's, it's, I think a good way to say it (laughs) is um, someone I started, I, when I started uh, writing, I started podcasting my first novel um, way back when, when podcasts were like, first starting, you know, 2008 is when I first launched. And one of the big podcast novelists, the first podcast novelist was Scott Sigler. And the best advice he gave me was you are not going to understand this business or your job for a good four to five years. Well, my ego instantly was like, (laughs) I'll show you, I'm going to understand it tomorrow. (laughs) Guess what? Four to five years later, click. All of a sudden, it was like, oh, I know what he's saying now. (laughs) I finally have the experience to truly understand. He was completely right. It took about four to five years right in there before I actually understood what I was doing. Um, Before it was just, like I said, that aggression, that just drive, push forward, write this book, get that book out there. Are people liking it? Okay, good. Then we're just going to keep going and... You, not a huge ton of extraneous thought or, you know, into it. But after about four or five years, then I realized, oh, this is a craft. <laughs> it's not just, it's not a talent. It's not, you know, some God given, you know, skill that uh, I'm the one that can do this. It's not, you know, it's, this is a craft. And I finally have the experience under my belt to understand my craft so much more that I can approach it in different ways. Um, So a long way to get to that answer (laughs) was, once again, my career and how I've approached the different novels and how they've been is, it's just like anything else. It's a growth process. Um, It takes experience, it takes knowledge. You know, hopefully with that comes wisdom. And then that, that affects how I approach new projects. It affects my writing style. It affects, you, you should change and grow. I, I wonder and worry about 
authors, you know, big authors that have been doing it for decades upon decades upon decades, and their writing style hasn't changed in 20 or 30 years. Um, you know, you could, there, there are a few, especially in science fiction, um, and like military sci-fi is probably the worst <laughs> with that, that you could pick up author A's book now that just came out last week and author A's book that came out 25 years ago. And there's not much difference. Um, if you pick up Stephen King's first book and then you pick up his book now, there's a different, he's grown and changed as a writer. He's still Stephen King, but you can see, I've read so many of his books. You can see where he's like, you know what? I'm taking a chance here. I'm just yep. going to totally do this in a different way. I'm going to do that. And that's good. You should, you should do that. Don't get stuck in those ruts. Allow that change to happen allow experience to influence how you write, you know, and that's, yeah, it, like I said, yeah, up and down, the up and down. <laughs> okay. And I mean, you're, 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 you know, Zburbia is basically, you know, the series that you're really, really known for, same as Roke, um, the mega series as well. <laughs> yeah. Um, my personal favorite is, you know, um, Max Rage, Intergalactic Badass, you know. Nice. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. The, the, the audio book, I was listening to the audio book and I just got the old Duke Nukem 3D game running through my head. Perfect. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, you know, where, where did Max, you know, where did Max Rage come from? <laughs> that was, I mean, he he's like the satirical writing Roke led to Max Rage. Um Roke was, you know, my serious space bounty hunter, um, you know, trying to make this a, a, a real universe, nothing absurd or too absurd yep. in there, uh, make sci-fi readers happy, um, jump on the fandom of Boba Fett and all, you know, that <laughs> kind of stuff and everything. Um, Max Rage was me making fun of myself and channeling the... Duke Nukem and the 80s and 90s action machismo. Um, it, it is pure satire. And it's why it's, it cracks me up. I've had people email me and either A, be offended because <laughs> they're just like, this is just misogynistic, sexist, over the top action, blah, 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 blah. And I'm like, yes, but you're not laughing. So you didn't get the joke. Okay. I'm making fun of all of that stuff. And then I will get, get people um, who will say, oh my God, this made me remember this scene in this movie and yep. all this. I'm like, yes, you totally got it. You get it. You understand. Um, every once in a while, I'll get somebody who will say, this is kind of like Roke, but not really. And I'll just be like, oh, okay. <laughs> Yeah, it sort of is, but yeah, okay. it's it, yeah. Max Rage is is me making fun of myself and then adding all those over the top influences <laughs> in there. Um, I I took all the blinders off, all the shackles off, everything, <laughs> and just said if I write it and it fits in the story and the plot, then it works. Um, I didn't second guess myself and go, "That's going to make someone mad," or <laughs> be like, "Oh, that's you know." I know sci-fi readers don't necessarily like this. I was like, no, I'm, I'm putting it in there. If it's, if, if it works and keeps the story going <laughs> and just keeps it moving, then it's going in, it's happening. <laughs> so oh, yeah. yeah. Oh, look, I, I, I as I said, I, I, I read the, I had the audio book and I was here in Mexico, we, Mexico city, the move, you know, public transportation, this is basically the only way to move. And sometimes you get stuck in three hour, four hour traffic jams, which is normal. Oh, okay. So when I was listening to it, there were many moments, many times I was on the subway where I would just have fits of pure, you know, just joyous belly laughter. And all the Mexicans are going, what the hell is the stranger? <laughs> what the hell? Oh <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. So, so Max Rage is Jake Bible turned up to 11. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, exactly. And in that spirit of that exact reference, you know, that spinal tap kind yeah. of <laughs> attitude. Yes, it is. Totally. <laughs> and are you going to, because you've got two books out with Max Rage, are you going to do a third or is that just? Um, it, it, it depends. I would love to get back to Max Rage. And I actually 
give a little little hint to Max Rage in my in my last Roke book, um, which is is kind of fun. Um, the the trick is is right now with writing, I have one more book that I, I plan on having Severed Press publish um, to finish out the flip side series. Um, and I haven't even started that yet. <laughs> I've got to. But right now, with the amount of titles and everything I have, what I'm slowly trying to do is get my rights back as contracts come up. So adding on to a series is tough because that extends that contract by another few years. Uh, so there are quite a few series I want to get to. <laughs> There's a few things I want to do. I, I want to do more Max Rage. I'd love to do more Fighting Iron, my mm -hmm. Mech Western. Loved it. <laughs> um, yeah, there's a couple others, you know, I would love to add to, um, my Level Dead series, you know, which started with Everrealm. Um, I would like to get into that, but if I write more and add on to that, then it's... it extends the contracts. So okay. it's going to be a few years before I start adding on to series. Once I get rights back, then I can add on to them um, and not have to worry about any contractual issues. Okay. And in the meantime, you can focus on other writing and getting those books planned before you hit tackle them. Yes. Okay. So, yeah. Okay. So, you know, you, you're, you're, you know, okay. I mean this with all due respect, but you're a bastard because you're a Bram Stoker and nominated you know, author, with all due respect. Yeah, <laughs> totally. And, you know, Dead Mech, that's where you got started with the podcast and then novels, Zeburbia as well, which that helped influence my first novel, um, Big Smoke. You know, Excellent. Um, you, you know, you, you, I love the Zeburbia, you know, Dead Team Alpha. I thought Dead Team Alpha was brilliant. Why did you go from writing... I'm going to call it action horror <laughs> to yeah. going into sci-fi. Um, number one, because my tastes are all over the place. So, I mean, I know a lot of people in their personal lives and personal tastes, there are horror fans and that's what they live for. Um, and there are those that even dial in you know, more and they're only zombie fans. You know, they, they like undead and zombie apocalypse. That's their horror. They don't want to watch ghosts. They don't want to read about, you know, werewolves. They, you know, zombies in that kind of thing. My tastes run everywhere. Um, so if I have an idea, then I'm thinking, oh, okay, well, I could do that. Um, my, you know, my first book, Dead Mech, while it does take place in you know a far future setting zombie apocalypse wasteland it's a military sci-fi book because it's it's a team of mech pilots yep. with these battle robots so i mean it really i really approached it more as action adventure um yeah military sci-fi uh my probably my biggest influence on it would be Mad Max, mm -hmm. um, which, you know, has no supernatural or horror or anything. That's just, that's post-apocalyptic yep. action thriller, you know, that kind of thing. So I would say it wasn't a hard switch going from horror action to sci-fi action because I just changed out the setting and, you know, some of the, the rules are just yep. different. Um, and that's really what it comes down to. I write in all kinds of different genres and it's just a matter of knowing the rules. And I've always read different genres. I love watching different genres and movies and yep. TV. It really just depends on what my mood is. Okay. Um, I actually haven't read any fiction in months. I've been just doing nonfiction audiobooks and books for the longest time. You know, that's it. And that's just where my brain is right now. That's, that's my interest is learning. And, yep. you know, so I'm in a nonfiction mood. I'm sure when I get back into fiction, there will probably be something that'll spur some ideas and be like, ooh, I could do that, but do this with it. And, uh -huh. you know, that kind of thing. <laughs> and, th and that tends to be a lot of stuff that um, influences, you know, my decisions on, you know, which genre and where I'm going to go, what I'm going to switch up to, what I want to do. Um, there's also the market you know, publishing market of what mm -hmm. is selling, um, that, that definitely influences me because I can switch back and forth from genres quickly. Um, I can jump onto something fast. 
Um, so military sci-fi and science fiction action adventure um, was big when I started Roke. Um, and when I was writing, you know, a lot of those, the, Roke was great. It was Salvage Merc 1, which actually was my huge hit sales and dollars wise for, you know, on Amazon. Um, and that's in the same universe. And, yes. you know, but I also was taking a kind of tongue in cheek. The character was definitely a smart ass, um, you know, bit of a drunk, didn't, <laughs> didn't really care a whole lot about everybody else so much. And um, so I, I was like, okay, it, it did great. The first book, the second book, not so much. And I was just noticing how, you know, some readers were just kind of like, you know, this is a fun book. It's great to read but I don't really like this guy. <laughs> I'm like, okay, so let's make a different character. And he may not be like likable, but that's kind of what everyone's going to know from the get-go, that you're not supposed to like him like him because he's not going to like you back. <laughs> so, um, And I was also, which is, here's funny, if you want to talk genre switching, reading a ton of Richard Stark's Parker crime novels from oh. back in the, the 60s and 70s. And those are outstanding, absolutely phenomenal. And I honestly was like, okay, I don't know if I could write a straight up crime novel with this kind of protagonist, but I can switch a few things. And what if I put him in space? <laughs> <laughs> And so from Master Thief, the character becomes a bounty hunter and then all of that. And that's what. So, you know, there was a few influences that had me switching from horror action to sci-fi action. Okay. Yeah. And, you know, it, it, in my mind, it's not a huge stretch. <laughs> For no, a lot of people, it was a lot of my fans are like, wait, I want more Z-Burbia. Or I want more mega. I want these, you know, I want misfit Navy SEALs to blow up more, you know, mutant sharks and stuff. <laughs> and they're like, why aren't you writing more of that? And it's like, well, I wrote that. <laughs> yep. It's right there. <laughs> I did that. <laughs> I'm doing this now. <laughs> and I have a whole, and honestly, I mean, I've got fans, a fan base for Zeburbia, a fan base for, um, mega and a fan base for Roke and then you know you look at the Venn diagram and they overlap but yep. it's definitely not all the same fan base there's which is great because that means I've got readers who have different tastes reading my stuff and maybe they'll give some of the other things on that Venn diagram a little a little sample and try and see if they like it um, so yeah <laughs> That makes perfect sense. <laughs> okay. And no, honestly, it does. Because, um, I mean, I'm nowhere near as prolific as you. Trying to get there. I think I've still got a long ways to go. <laughs> <laughs> but, I mean, you, you said you said that, um, you know, Rogue, um, Savage Merc 1, you know, that's all in the same kind of universe. Mm -hmm. Is that intent? Like, okay, you look at Seaburbia and Dead Team Alpha, even Dead Mech. You could look at Dead Mech being part of that, but set way in the future. Yeah. Same, you know. I'm pretty sure Max Rage is in a far twisted corner of the Rogue and Savage Merc 1 universe. Is that all intentional or is that just a byproduct, an accident? Um, a, an accident um, to a certain extent. Um, now, Max Rage, I will say, is in a different universe. Okay. <laughs> but like I said, I was able to connect the universes in the last Rogue novel and I you know, figured it out. In a way, it's, it's the same like Stephen King influence there. Um, all of his works are connected. Every single book, short story, everything, but they're multiverses. Yep. And that's how he, he does it. And I, I kind of am like, okay, I can, I can get behind that. But for a single linear universe going start, you could say Zeburbia starts it and Roke ends it. Okay. There, it's all connected. And I actually have a little um, essay I wrote on my website that says, you know, the, the whole apocalypse and okay. explains how you go from Zeburbia to Dead Team Alpha. And then hundreds of years later, you go into Dead Mech and that all, everything that happens there. And then hundreds of years later, you go into Fighting Iron. 
Mm-hmm. <laughs> and that happens there and then so on there's a whole middle period that i haven't touched because you can go from fighting iron to met core and that one is this weird little in between it's not as advanced we haven't gotten to the salvage merc one and roke the the universe and galaxy has not really fleshed out yet it's, right it's for the beginning of earth humans getting out there into everything um there's so there's a whole chunk between that and fighting iron that i haven't filled in anywhere there's huge gaps but really you could put them all in the same history um you know just (laughs) it's almost like the zombie apocalypse is what was the catalyst for humans getting the hell off the planet (laughs) i can get behind that (laughs) exactly okay so if it's all let's use the multiverse idea if it's all set in the same multiverse then are we going to get your version of infinite crisis or are we going to get the big mashup (laughs) um well only only if i do a time bending thing because you know everybody in zeburbia is dead so they they can't it's it's the beginning of the timeline roke being the end of the Mm. timeline you know or the latest in the timeline there um, so that couldn't all mash up because it's all happened unless I want to play time games, yep. which I do have my flip side series, which uh-huh. has time bubbles. <laughs> so who knows what could pop out of the time bubbles, how that could work. I could start war- really warping time and space and it's, it's a possibility. I play with a little bit in Roke's war in my latest Roke novel. Um, it was, you know, just because of that reason that I wanted I wanted to kind of put the groundwork out there that I could end up <laughs> pulling from the different universes um, to see, hey, wonder if these guys would be fun <laughs> if they met up and, you know, had adventures. So it, it could conceivably happen. It would take a lot of work to really go with the, you know, full, yeah, full oh, yeah. mishmash of everything. But yeah. <laughs> Come on. I mean, Max Rage teaming up with Rogue. It's Tango and Cash oh, no, in that, space. <laughs> that that one would be a lot. That would, would would be fairly simple. It's if I wanted to bring any characters from the beginning of the timeline oh, yeah. into up, then then things get tricky because um, you know that you also you also have a lot of fans that um, hate time travel. <laughs> so really? <there's> that. <laughs> yeah, time travel is a tricky one. It can tick a lot of people off. They can really not be too happy about it. <laughs> Okay. Um, some people see it as a crutch. Some people, time travel breaks their brain. So they just get really mad about it because they can't <laughs> figure out how it all connects. Um, and it's, it's also, in a way, no matter what the subgenre is, it's also kind of its own genre. And some people yeah. just don't like time travel genres. Like my wife hates body switching. Okay. Any story with body switching absolutely despises it. So if there's ever an episode in a series we're watching and she's like body switching episode of course they're gonna do that one Uh, i mean she hates it hates body switching it drives her nuts and so there are fans that hate time travel or there are fans that hate mashups that hate bringing characters from different series together so it's when if i do it there are all these factors i really have to consider because it has to be done right or i'm gonna anger a bunch of people (laughs) but then yes you will anger a bunch of people but you will then have those people who are going to be like fuck yeah this is what i want you know oh yeah (laughs) exactly and that's who i'm writing for definitely i know i that's the core those are the ones who are like fuck yeah (laughs) this is awesome though that's the smiles on their faces that's that's what i want I just have to massage it so I'm also not getting rocks and tomatoes thrown at me by the other <laughs> other readers who hate, you know, hate the other stuff. So I want to I want to bring everybody in to that joy yep. to, of the you know readership that I'm aiming for, um, and you know convert instead of you know <laughs> um, shoved to the side there. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So okay. In saying that. How much market research do you do before you start writing a, um, uh, you know, you start working on a project or is it more like whatever, if it sells, it sells? <laughs> um, I will definitely look, if I have an idea and it's a burning idea that I'm like, okay, I've 
got to write this, I will check the charts um, on Amazon and, you know, Google Play yep. and, you know, all the, all the retailers um, just to make sure <laughs> my idea isn't at the very bottom of the sales list. Um, if it's in the top quarter, I'll go for it without even thinking about it. Yep. Uh, if it's maybe middling right in there, mm, I'll start to think because, you know, it, I don't want to put a ton of work into something and have it just completely bomb because I've, I've done everything right before put a ton of work into something and have it bomb. <laughs> so I don't want to start out behind. Yep. <laughs> um, of course, at the same time, nobody in publishing knows what makes a hit. There isn't a single human being in this business that knows the secret to how do you make a bestseller? Um, otherwise, there'd be bestsellers constantly, constantly, constantly yeah. by every single best-selling author. Even best-selling authors don't always have best-selling works. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, you know, it's, there's, you also have to go on instinct. You, you know, so I look at the market, but then I also look at is this going to be fun? Is this going to be something enjoyable? Is this going to be something other people will want? Or am I just writing it for myself? Is yeah. it just an idea? Am I trying to look at numbers and justify writing this? Am I trying to figure out you know, ways to say, yeah, of course, your fans are going to love this idea. They're going to go for it. You bet. Um, just because it's something I want to write. Yeah. I, I know there's the adage, you, you, you should write what you're passionate about. You should, you know, write what energizes you because that's going to come across in the novel. But at the same time, for me, I have even no matter how much I would love to write something or how much I absolutely love the idea. If the business part of me goes, it's never going to sell. <laughs> then I have to put it to the side until it seems like the market is ready, um, that it is going to be something that will sell. Um, so I'll say here's, here's, here's an interesting one. Uh, Everrealm is a lit RPG novel. So it's literature role-playing game. Yep. Now it really should be called just game lit because it's the element and the platform and everything is a game that the characters are in that they real real characters real people sucked into an imaginary game with real stakes yep. and things like that um, but i don't have the game mechanics really in there to justify calling it lit rpg okay which brings up <laughs> why i know that <laughs> is because i was looking at the market and i'm like wow these lit rpg novels are ripping it up they are doing amazing they are you know, really selling. And, you know, I talked to Severed Press and said, hey, I'm thinking of doing that and got the message back. Yeah, we've been looking at that for a while now. And if you want to, please do go for it. And it's like, okay. So I studied the market. I studied some of the books and I'm like, well, I can kind of do part of that. The trick with that is here, there's two things in that market that I didn't realize, you know, yes, sales up there, huge, great. That's awesome. We released that book, huge spike in sales, huge drop off, like almost instantly. Oh, geez. And that's because it is a very cultish readership. Um, so a lot, I mean, it's very gamer oriented. Yeah. These are a lot of gamers reading a book with a game in it, but a gamer readership is a different culture than just your military sci-fi readership or your zombie apocalypse readership. The game lit readership is very much more like video games. Yep. They are ruthless. They are brutal. It gets cultish real fast and they have no problem banding together as a real gang and attacking and going after someone. Sounds like <laughs> so, nice people. <laughs> Well, yeah, and that's why there's only one book in that series is because it sold great, but then the sales dropped off fast and then the personal attacks kicked yep. in. Um, and I was like, wow, that was part of my research. I wasn't either, wasn't paying attention to 
um, or just missed. I, I didn't look at the culture of the readership that I was writing towards. And um, that was kind of a, you know, that was a, that was a big mistake. I did everything else right. I wrote a book in that genre. We released it. It's a good book. It's fun. I had a hell of a lot of, you know, fun writing it. Um, but yeah, I did not prepare for it shooting up the charts and then all of a sudden the reviews and people attacking it and it instantly shooting down. And it's not like other novels where sci-fi, even horror and all that, you can go up the charts and if people start criticizing, then it, the sales will kind of do this like normal plateau and then drop off. This was an instant gang up destroy kind of thing <laughs> where the sales went up a couple of prominent people in the forums and communities said, no, this isn't what it's supposed to be. And then everybody else went, you're right. This is no big, no. And it was crazy. Man. So yeah, it's um, so even doing my market research, that one bit me in the butt. <laughs> big time. And I haven't touched that genre since now, since it's they've broken out and there's a bigger umbrella of game lit so if it includes game elements or includes sure. the the setting is game and all of that, then it fits. Okay. Um, and that's where I would be. Um, but because this was such a new genre and it was called lit RPG and I was just hopping into the lit RPG, but didn't include all of the game mechanics that you're supposed to, <laughs> I got lit up. <laughs> 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 they, they went at me. <laughs> Yeah, that that's I, I I never wanted to write a you know game lit book, but you kind of just put the fear of fear of that into me now, not to do even more so, not yeah. to touch it. <laughs> game, game lit now is fine if you use the big umbrella. Yeah, but if you're going to do what's called lit RPG, it needs to actually have game mechanics in there, yeah. as if you novelized. It was a novelization of a D and D game. Yeah, in a way. Yeah. Um, you, as the writer, as the author, you're the game master, um, and but you still have to have all the game elements of the hit points and the actions and the curses and the magic yeah. and the things, and you have to follow <laughs> the rules. You know, it, it's it's like writing, yeah, a novelized game. Okay. Um, yeah. So that's that's the difference. Um, okay. So when yeah. Big umbrella, good. Game lit. <laughs> yeah, but... but. <laughs> uh, and the community has chilled out a lot. It's been a few years since I wrote Everrealm. Um, and the community itself, as communities like that are, um, you know, factions break out and they have their own internal war. And of course, yeah. they, they, they decide to destroy each other <laughs> as those fandoms tend to do <laughs> in everything. They, they, you know, and now, now I think the dust is settled and um there's been some good clear lines drawn so you know you, you can fall on this side of the line and still live <laughs> okay and <laughs> you know, one day step you'll... onto this side of the line watch your back a little gonna, <laughs> you know, they're that, gonna that, hand you your yeah. balls <laughs> yeah exactly pretty much okay yeah. okay and i mean I've seen I've I've seen you interviewed before on other channels, and actually, my, my first time I ever heard about you was on the Dead Robot Society podcast. Oh, okay, yeah, yeah. those guys. Jeez. Yeah, your your nemesis. Holy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, and that's that's where that's where first heard about you. And one of the first books I bought bought that was yours was the omnibus version of Reign of Four, volumes one and two. Oh, okay, yeah, yeah, and it's one I don't hear hear people talking about in regards when they talk to you and is that because you just don't want to talk about it or just no one seems to know about it uh no one seems to know about it and um i've just got you know newer projects other things going on that it's you know whatever is in front of me now is yep. what i tend to talk about <laughs> um and it's an ended you know it's a, it's an ended series it's books one two three four done over so I'm not adding to the series. So there's no reason for me to kind of keep bringing yep. it up. Um, the other thing is it was, it was, it's published by Permuted Press, a different publisher than, you know, than yep. what I have Z Burbia and the majority of my books are with Severed Press. 
and I have to say it was it was in the beginning an exciting experience. Um, there was a lot of there there's some publishing heavyweights that were kind of behind Permuta Pet Press. It was a small niche press, then it was sold to a media company and some you know big industry uh, experienced execs hopped in. Um, there was a lot of big promises, um, you know, a decent amount of money thrown at me. And then it turned out that really they didn't quite know how to get the results, sales results that they had been promising. Oh. Um, it, it was it was left to languish. We'll, okay. we'll just say that. It didn't have the marketing support. Um, they were in a way permuted was trying to do the severed press model of just put out as much as humanly possible and hopefully something sticks. Um, but that was a different perception than what I was given going into it. Right. So in a way, reign of four is actually some of my, I don't want to say some of my best writing, but it is, it's, it's some damn good books. And I really love what I created there. Um, but it's, it's also kind of, painful to go back to <laughs> okay, okay i, I won't open own so old wounds <laughs> but but i will say wounds heal over time oh, okay. and it's been <laughs> quite a long time i mean we're we're talking over half a decade since i wrote those um and i'm kind of getting back to them um so i actually plan on doing something not adding to the series but getting back in and kind of promoting it okay um yeah, maybe maybe doing some readings and so I've got some plans of um, you know Reign of Four trying to to boost that back up. The other thing is is foolishly I did not keep my audiobook rights. Everything else I have my audiobook rights to. My permuted titles I don't have the audiobook rights. They wanted them and that was kind of a no deal thing. Um, so that's one thing that helps with if I had the audiobook rights then I would be able to produce those audiobooks, get those out there. And it would be a little bit more in my personal radar. Mm -hmm. um, right now, I only get a certain percent of print royalties, you know, small, your industry average percent, yeah. um, you know, about this, you know, a good, you know, decent, you know, ebook royalties. But otherwise, I mean, there, there isn't a whole huge reason to, you know, really have put my energy behind yep. those um until until now just because i it's been a long time so i think I, if i get them back out there it's no. gonna hit a whole bunch of new readers who have never even heard of this well, yeah, yeah. And, and that's the thing i mean it's basically historical science fiction <laughs> yeah i mean it's it's based on edward the first second and third and the black prince of you know the reign of england the you know the plant the great Plantagenets and that whole thing. I mean, it's, I've always been fascinated by that, that part. I like, for some reason, I have no idea, but royal history <laughs> in, in the UK has always kind of fascinated me. But that right there, those, the three Edwards yep. and then um, the Black Prince, who would have been the fourth if he lived. <laughs> Um, have always the, their stories are just crazy and um, I mean it's just the drama and everything is just perfect I mean it's yeah. and I was like you know I'd always actually wanted to write a straight historical fiction series based on them and then I was like yeah that's not gonna happen that's that's way <laughs> that's that's so much research I mean because you have that's called actual you know getting things factually accurate yep. <laughs> no but if i put it in space i can make everything <laughs> up and just take the plots of and elements of the lives of and the spark that really has kind of kept those stories going for hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years um if i put that into it then that's what i'm doing i mean kind of the same as you know my doing roke kind of based on inspired by um, Starks Parker. Yeah. So Reign of Four is inspired by the Edwards. Um, and it was just, it was a lot of fun to write. Um, and I also was, when I was writing it, I'm like, okay, this is space opera, but there was definitely those elements of Dune in the back mm -hmm. of my head too. So I, I knew, I mean, I'm a huge fan, love Dune. 
And so I, I, I could feel that I'm like this, I can do this because I really know what this is. And I know it's been done and it's been done right before. So, um, yeah, I was, it, it was, yeah, taking all that influence and the lifelong dream of, of wanting to write about the Edwards, but not actually writing about the Edwards. So yeah, it's a, it's lazy historical fiction then. <laughs> yeah. No, totally. Yeah. Yeah. And then throw it in space yep. and then I can make everything up. So, you know, yeah. It's, it seems like that's a reoccurring motive with you where it's like, oh, I want to do this. Too much work. I'll just put it in space. <laughs> oh, yeah. You bet. <laughs> it's, you know, there's, I have so many different influences that, you know, it's like, oh, I would love to do this in space. <laughs> Let's do it that way. Um, building the Galactic Fleet universe, starting with Salvage Merc 1, kind of has allowed me to do that. Like, right. um, I have Galactic Vice, which is just a straight up vice cop police <laughs> procedural novel, but it's set on a, you know, on a base in space. It's, you know, that's a heck of a long one. Drop Team Zero is just basically a special forces team. You know, so it's military special forces set in space. Yep. <laughs> you know? um, so it allows me to play in the sandbox I've already built, but mix things up enough that I'm just not, I'm not being repetitive, you know, of myself. I'm not being derivative of myself, but I'm also being able to stay interested and do mix some genres that, I like to mix. I mean, that's my first novel, Dead Mech, was I wanted to write a zombie novel, but I did not want to write the same zombie novel that had been written before. Um, and this was back in 2007 when I started writing it. Um, so the, the zombie boom hadn't hit yet. Yeah. Um, so I pretty much had read every zombie novel, watched every zombie movie, knew everything there was. And I was like, I just don't want to do it the same way. And then I was like, ooh, what if I said it way in the future? Okay, well, then you can add all kinds of stuff. What would happen in the future? And then I happened to be sitting on the couch and Transformers 2 was coming out at that time. And I saw you know, that and I was instantly like, oh, wow, big giant robots. Yeah, maybe they could, oh, Max, 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 Max. And, that, and <laughs> like that, that's when I was like, you know, that's why, I mean, really, is it in post-apocalyptic? literature yes is it a zombie novel well it has zombies in it mm -hmm. <laughs> but really it's 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 a military sci-fi novel set in the zombie apocalypse <laughs> so that's what i did for a little bit set it in the zombie apocalypse and then yep. space became my zombie apocalypse it's <laughs> like ooh, i want to do this i'll set it in space <laughs> so basically you you owe your entire career to transformers yeah, yeah, Transformers and uh, Mad Max. Yeah, definitely. So yeah. when when are you going to do your just your balls little old you know the Jake Bible version of a Transformer story? That's a good question, and that that's that's always kind of simmered there for a, a little bit, and I've had that in the back of my mind for a while um, because I recognize the influence of what started Dead Mac of you know. Ooh, mash up this and mash up this yep. and do this and twist that. Um, it'll probably happen at some point. <laughs> I have ideas um, set in space. <laughs> so, <laughs> but it, it, it could easily happen at some point, some, some version of that, um, your sentient robots yep. thing. And I even play with it a little bit not the transformation part, but the sentient robots thing. I, I definitely play with in my Apex trilogy. And yep. I've got AIs throughout all of my stuff. There's, I don't know what it is about AIs. I've always loved AIs. Um, I think it's probably ever since uh, 2001 Space Odyssey. I mean, how? Um, yep. and, and the beauty of, I think I probably wouldn't like AIs and wouldn't have gravitated that way if it hadn't been for the danger um yeah. it's 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 fire it's a virus it's whatever it is this gets out and is no longer controlled 
and it'll end everything. Yeah. And I, I like that element to it. And I think that's the beauty of why 2001 Space Odyssey and how influenced is because at the end of the day, this amazing scientific invention is the bad guy. <laughs> and I love that element because then I also love being able to twist the AIs and make them totally good. Yep. You know, having this, this amazing, you know, personality that's like, okay, not human, but not out to destroy the world or control humanity or space races or whatever the heck, not doing any of that. It's just, you know, hey, I'm a personality too, <laughs> y'all. So <laughs> okay. there's, yeah. <laughs> You've got to do an AI that actually says that, an AI that ha that says y'all. You've got to have that now. <laughs> yeah, I pro I probably do. I got to look in Fighting Iron. I wonder if you say, say that. I don't know. I'll have I've, I'll have I've, to I've, look and see. I've read Fighting Iron one and two. I don't I don't remember. Might not be. There might not be y'all in there. I think it's something but, else because I would remember. Yeah. I, I just, I just, I just, I remember that because it's just so you know particular. It's like um, Portal in Portal Two with the character of Wheatley, you know, with the British Cockney silly accent, you know, that oh, sort yeah. of thing. <laughs> yeah. So you, you, so when you're writing a story, when you're writing, it's got to be fun for you. Yes. Okay, so yes. <laughs> have you ever started to write something and then all of a sudden it's turned into a slog for one reason or another? Um, yeah. And I mean I've I've written there's there's been several of my novels that um the idea and everything starts off fun. The creation process was was that was the fun part, and you know, the beginning of the novel, I'm like, yeah, and then then the reality of having to actually create the middle and end and all of that, then it becomes work. And I realized that, you know, maybe this idea wasn't exactly the funnest and the, you know, as I thought it was going to be. And then it's like, Oh, I got to get through this. I hate this whole thing. I've got a few novels where I've definitely done that. And there's some of them I will readily admit are probably trash. Um, some of them I've gone back and read, you know, reluctantly, and um, knowing how much I hated the process and went, oh, wow, this actually isn't bad. And this is kind of fun. I guess I did a good job and hid my personal feelings and, and didn't put myself <laughs> into this, my loathing into this one. This, this actually isn't too bad. Nice. <laughs> um, I don't have any, you know, what are called trunk novels, anything that I've um, started, finished, and then said, no, that's, that's not everything. Every novel I've written, um, has been published. Okay. Um, and I've finished every novel I've written. The only things I haven't finished are when I was trying to adapt a short story going, oh, this would be much better as a novel and try to adapt that into something, get about 20,000 words into it and go, nope, this was a short story. <laughs> <laughs> There's a reason my brain wrote it as a short story to begin with, because this does not hold up as a long form. <laughs> so I have a few stopped, you know, you know, some, yeah. some starts that have just fizzled and gone, I, but not many. I mean, I probably have four that okay. I've just gone, okay, I got to get out of this project because this was a mistake to start in the you know first place. Yep. Um, but really in the past 10 years, any novel I've started, I've finished. Um, okay. And even if I've hated it. <laughs> <laughs> and there's probably not a lot of authors who can actually say that. Who <laughs> can say, yep, I finished everything. <laughs> no, no, there, there definitely aren't. And um, I'm also one of those few authors that my very first novel I wrote ended up being published. Yep, same here. <laughs> yeah, I mean, there's, there's, there's not a ton. Or I guess... Nowadays, there, there are more um, when you add indie publishing into it yep. and self-publishing, all of that. There are a lot of writers who have like, this is my first novel. Boom, it's going out there, world. Get, be prepared. Or people who are just like, I've got one novel in me. Here it is. <laughs> and there you go. Oh, yeah. um, and luckily, over the years, luckily and unluckily, <laughs> but, uh, luckily, indie publishing has gotten so much better. There are some amazing amazing authors out there who have never been traditionally published yeah. and their work is outstanding and highly entertaining. Um, 
Also, that means there's some amazing authors out there who've never been published, who their work is outstanding and highly entertaining and are taking up market space. Not that it's ever, and this is the thing, it's never a competition between authors, okay. ever. You know, my putting my novel out does not diminish you putting your novel out and all of that. <clears throat> but people, the readers only have so much time in their lives and they have to choose what they're going to read and the more you put out there in the market, especially in military sci-fi, which has become probably the number one go-to genre for indie, indie writers, yeah. um, other than the romance area, you can get into that. That's a whole other thing. That's a genre that by itself is, sells as much as almost all the other genres put together. Um, and, that's and, a whole and, other world. <laughs> and, and just, I've always wanted to ask you this. When do we get the Jake Bible erotica novel? <laughs> All right. So I'm going to tell you a little something here. It's already out there. There's really? a couple of them. Yes, it's just not under my name. Ah. Um, there are uh, dozens and dozens of erotica short stories out there that are not under my name. <laughs> um, I will say this without ego. I am one of the writers and authors who helped build the Kindle to a platform that could be sustainable. And that's because Erotica built the Kindle. Just like every other entertainment platform out there, porn builds it first, folks. <laughs> that's why we have Blu-rays. <laughs> Blu-ray discs are because video games and porn, <laughs> that's why those <laughs> exist. Basically everything out there that's ever made it to market it's... is because porn has said, yeah, we could do something with that, you bet. And then they... <laughs> explode and it becomes profitable and yep. so on and so forth <laughs> kindle amazon knew that they totally knew that and they allowed all this huge massive gold rush of erotica titles to populate the kindle once they hit a sales threshold that they were happy with they got rid of erotica now didn't get rid of it but they changed their algorithm so it no longer showed up on the front page of anything uh -huh. Amazon, Kindle related. It was no longer in the top sellers lists. It was no longer any, I mean, it, and this is honestly, I have a graph in my KDP account that shows sales going boom, 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 straight down. You can see where they flipped the switch on the algorithm. Jeez. And they destroyed the erotica market and shunned it and threw it out in the back in the woodshed and said, you're in there. Don't ever come out, you crazy, ugly monster. Um, it's different now. It's now a much more erotica, but it's very well segmented. Um, you know your genres, yeah. you have this, you have that. Um, people now can look at a cover and go, well, I know exactly what that is. <laughs> It's, it's no problem. It's, it's built back up mm -hmm. considerably. But in the very beginning, it, it, Erotica built the Kindle. I was one of those authors <laughs> under a couple different pseudonyms, um, was making bank beyond belief. It was a gold rush. And then, of course, as gold rushes happen, everybody jumped on it, yep. came into it. As soon as that happened, Amazon started you could see them starting to tweak things. You could see them going, uh-oh, this is going to get out of control. Yep. And But then you could see it was the second or third Christmas after the Kindle was released. I think third Christmas after the Kindle was released that as soon as that Christmas was over, January 1st, they cut off the Jeez. algorithm. So all of those Kindle gift cards would be spent on other stuff. Of course. Good, and yeah. build up those genres. Yeah. And yeah. that's what happened. And, you know, I get it from a business point oh, of view. yeah. But as a writer, that really hurt. <laughs> <laughs> I, I bet. I bet. So, okay, you said it. Erotica's, make, Erotica's now been built back up. It's no longer yeah. the, the, the ugly, horrible monster cousin trapped in the um, woodshed, right. to use your words. Yeah. Would you go back to it? Or are you still writing Erotica? No, I'm not still writing erotica. Right. Um, I will say one thing that was great about writing erotica is um, 
literally it was just a down and dirty way of, <laughs> of writing and it just got my experience of writing up i mean i'm writing these derivative stories horrible awful uh -huh. crap i mean this stuff <laughs> sucks i mean at no point a then i was not going for quality and b now as a ex more experienced writer i could be like oh that isn't even like bad quality bad quality i mean that's just horrible what do you i was just puking out words and getting out and trying to get titles out into the marketplace yep. um still sold so, i mean huh still sold <laughs> Oh yeah, it's st it's still sold. I I um oh god, what was your original question? See, I went on a tangent there. <laughs> no, it's okay. The question was okay, since it's now back up yeah. to being would you go back to writing okay. erotica? <laughs> okay. No, because I did it. I got what I needed from it. And it's now in that same problem as military sci-fi. Yep. Um trying to get into that market, it is full. Yep. Um it, it would be rough to try and jump in there and make a living at it because it's, it is a glutted market. Um, so, and then, so those are the, the main reasons. Um, also in a way, what was funny, what I realized is writing erotica is what allowed me to really get into writing action later on. Cause it's pretty much the same beats in, instead of, sexy time it's violent time <laughs> and, and you're kind of using the same story beats the same rhythm the same same stuff you just have to change your nouns and verbs a little <laughs> you know don't put it there shoot it there i mean that's, <laughs> that's and still, so things are still being inserted <laughs> yeah exactly <laughs> You live and happy and are happy here. You die and are bloody here. It's all a mess, you know. And uh, so it really helped me to actually write action later on. So I, I got what I got out of the erotica stuff, okay. and I just don't think I don't see any reason to go back. And also, I just don't have any titles or ideas. That's that's the thing. Um, you know, back then it was just like I said, puke out as many titles yep. as fast as possible. If I'm going to put my time and energy into something now, it's going to have to pay off. It's going to have to be something that, you know, I really do believe in. I, I know is going to, you know, don't know, <laughs> but I, I think is going to hit the market well, is going to sell, is, is all of that. And I just don't have any ideas for erotica that would that would switch it, that would change it, that would turn it on it, turn it on its head, um, that would make it fun for me to write. So yeah, come on, you, so. you could you could write the good version of Fifty Shades of Grey. There's your challenge. There, there. I go. <laughs> write the good version. I, or, I could just put it in space. That's what I could do. <laughs> and but that's out there. That's the thing. That's already there. There is space erotica. There is every type of genre you can think of now there is an erotica section of it. There's space erotica, fantasy erotica. There's obviously dinosaur erotica. Um, there's, there's everything you can think of. It's out there. Is there military sci-fi erotica? Yes. No way. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yes. Oh, completely. Damn. Damn. Yeah. Go, go to, if you look up military sci-fi, um, especially if you go to like Google Play, mm -hmm. um, well, to a certain extent, but yeah, look, look up military sci-fi bestsellers lists and you're going to see erotic titles that have kind of hopped in there okay, or semi-erotic or yep. just military sci-fi romance, ah, you okay. know? So it's, you know, it's erotica minus the explicit parts, you know, <laughs> or it's, they use euphemisms. <laughs> I guess they'd be science fiction euphemisms. <laughs> but, Gaming has yeah. a new meaning. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. <laughs> there you go. See, and that's the thing. If I did approach it, it would be so satirical that I think I would end up ticking off a lot of erotica readers. Well, I mean, you've already done the satire with um, Max Rage. You might just do the porno version of Max Rage. That's true. I, c I could do that. Although, you know, Max Rage is definitely a, a, a hard R. Yeah, well, that's, sure. a, that's the thing. When you're saying, you know, there's not much difference between violence and, and sex, I'm think, I was thinking, yeah, it's that idea is crystal clear in Max Rage. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah, totally. So, yeah, in a way, yeah, my, my erotica experience, I was able to throw that into a sci-fi setting for certain scenes. 
for the sexy parts, you know, because you can't have Mr. Machismo badass, intergalactic badass, unless he's getting the ladies. Yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah. Okay. That, that, that went into a weird direction. Because, <laughs> you know, every author I know, and I've spoken to them, you eventually had that conversation about, you know, oh, yeah, you know, maybe you're writing a writer because it does make bank. Yeah. And I think, and one, one thing I've always noticed when I'm talking to others is coming up with an author name is the worst part of it. <laughs> yeah, right, I'm, I'm, I am. I'm not, I'm not going to ask you to divulge your erotica names. Don't worry. <laughs> I, I'm pretty good with names. And I actually came up with the, the pen name first and um, ran it by a few people. And they were like, you suck, man. That's, I wish I had that pen name. Damn it. That's a great one. That is, it's actually, it's a pen name I could take right now and apply to any genre and it would okay. be a great pen name. Okay. And that's kind of the key is you want, you want a pen name that can fit anywhere because if it can fit in any genre, then that means the reader is going to take that name seriously. Yeah. They're going to forget it in three seconds because, you know, they, bought the book for many reasons not for this name until they start liking it and then they start looking for that author you know but um yeah you 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 want a pen name that, that really can hop in yep. here there anywhere and i had a good one for my erotica almost to the point where i'm actually kind of ticked with myself because <laughs> i would like to use that name again for some other ideas i have but i would need to destroy the internet to make that happen so well, i can wipe all all existence of stuff out <laughs> well i mean good luck with that okay thanks. very very doable i think right but yeah you self-published the erotica so you could unpublish them wait a period oh, of yeah. time and then use that pen name you again yeah i could and there's another thing i could also do is unpublish all of it change the name the and pen then... name for all of that content republish it which would make it all new <laughs> with a new name change yep. a few things in the story so it isn't completely yep. and if i were to get flagged and someone said hey you this is you know plagiarism this all already existed as this i could be like yeah i know <laughs> <laughs> and that's when exactly. the dirty truth comes out <laughs> yeah, re-released as um and then use that pen name yep. later yeah for something so more you, current so you've got, you've yeah got there's options. There are options. I have thought about this, <laughs> but also there's only so many hours in the day and yeah. I've got all these other projects I'm working <laughs> on. And I was like, no, I can't tackle that. I can't do it. So yes, there, there, there's already a little mini plan okay. in my head that if I ever need to, I know how to get out of the situation yep. and how to fix it and make it work. But the amount of time <laughs> is, is what stops me yeah. every time. Yeah. And, and that is the problem. Cause I, I, you know, writing suburbia you you know you use that to document your day-to-day -day life basically and you know i've been listening i you know listened to it and you know there was that period where when i first started listening to it, you were a full-time author and then yeah. due to various reasons you had to get a day job and now you're back to being a full-time author yes <laughs> do you miss being a, did you miss being a full-time author when you had to have a day job or um in the beginning no in the very beginning of, of the day job, I was like, woo, people. <laughs> wow. Okay. So I'm interacting with other people and I'm talking to them and I don't have to, I just have to work. I don't have to think up everything, every single aspect. I've got other people handling this, other people handling that. It was, it was, it, I needed a break. I had written 50 novels in five years. Yep. So that's 10 a year. And some of those years had more than 10 in there for the year. I mean, I cranked them out. So I was, I needed a break. Yep. Um, after a while of, you know, a few months, things, the reality of working the nine to five again, I'm like, oh, there's people. <laughs> oh, I've got to interact with you. Oh, what do you mean I can't control that part of this job? Yes, I should be able to. I have a better idea than you. <laughs> I've got, oh, morons. There's morons. <laughs> so the reality of working with others and the nine to five set in after a few months. And I was like, okay, 
damn it, I wish I could get away from this break uh, and go back to writing full time. Unfortunately, the way that happened was a pandemic hit. Yeah. <laughs> and the, my day job was as a sales manager. And so I uh, managed a couple reps who, and we sold patches, um, actual embroidered patches um, to retail stores and other items, other things too. But of course, when COVID hit, the entire retail word, world shut down. So yep. there was no need for me. <laughs> um, got laid off. Boom. And I was back to it. The cool thing of that is in order to kind of still make a living and where I was at, I luckily was able to hop into audiobook narrating and producing and make some money that way. So, which is great because that's kind of shifted my brain. I started in audio, which is what's funny. So, I mean, I, I've been doing it, but it was always just kind of my thing. Yep. Um, when you're narrating and producing audio books, then it gets a little more professional. Um, and each book I narrated and produced, I got better and better and better and so on to the point where I put out my own Roke 6 and Roke 7. I narrated myself um, once again to issues. And that's why I didn't go with the same narrator. Nothing against Andy did an amazing job. But because of contractual things, if yeah. I had done the same thing with Andy, then it would have extended stuff even se another seven years, another seven years, and so on. And it was like, ah, I can't do that. But um, yeah, getting the audiobook production gigs made a huge difference because it, it helped broaden my skill set even more, made it more serious. I also realized the importance, the, I mean, I did before the importance of audiobooks, but I think in the pandemic, um, audiobook sales have gone up. Um, podcast listening has gone up because people have been stuck and yep. um, they've got still got to do things and can't just spend all day their face in a book or face in a Kindle. They got to do other things. And the beauty of audiobooks is they can allow you to clean your house, to, to drive, to cook, to do whatever, and you can still listen to them at the same time. Um, they allow that multitasking. And so that has changed my mind a little bit on how I approach some projects that I thought were going to be straight up novels. I now have some audio ideas. Um, it's given me some skills to hop into uh, audio heavy centric video games, uh -huh. things like that. There's like, how can I take this skill set um, that I've really been honing uh, for about a year now, like really heavy into it? How can I take that and build on it? <clears throat> so, yeah, not having the day job anymore, I think would have been great anyway, but I would have been stuck right in what I was in before. The audio element has really helped. And now I'm like, okay, I may not be selling as many books as I want, but I have projects and ideas and I know what I'm going to be doing. And eventually I'm going to get to that point where things will be steady, yep. growing, no problem. So yeah. Um, hey. Yeah. So that's where I've been. yeah. It, 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 of course, if, um, you know, <laughs> writing income doesn't stay at a certain level, then I may be looking at that day job again. <laughs> well, a good option. And this is what I'm doing here in Mexico is I teach English yeah. to adults, to businesses. So, you know, I get a couple of class. I have uh, met the worst day, worst day I ever get is like four classes. And then in between those classes, I get like an hour of break to our break sometime. There you go. Yeah. Nice. The pay is terrible because it's Mexico. But <laughs> right. there, is, there, is, there is the freedom still to be able to, to do all the writing. So, you know, yeah. that, that could be an option, you know, if you, if you have to. <laughs> yeah, and, and I can always... The, the reason I was able to get into writing, really writing and tackle it is because at the time I was a customer service manager for an online supplement retailer. And during the downtimes, if there are no phones ringing and there's no emails coming in, it's not like I could get up and I had to go help in a different department because the phone could ring. <laughs> so I'm there and there's nothing to do. So I was just reading books. And that's when I was like, you know, I should get back into writing. 
And so it was that customer service job that allowed me to launch my writing career because I had the downtime to do it. So in a way, now that we've, we've really changed from in-person to a lot of at-home work, there is, you know, if I go back to full-time work, I could look at doing customer service from home. (laughs) The technology is there. It can be done. Not a problem. And then during the downtime, I could write, write, write. There you go. Yeah. So there's, there are possibilities. I have thought, how can I do the hybrid because I've done the hybrid before. How could I do it again? Um, and not have to, you know, give up writing or shove writing to nights and weekends and things like that. Yeah. And have to interact with morons all the time. (laughs) Morons. Okay. I've got, I've got one last question for you, Jake. Okay. Okay. And I, I actually, I could, I could keep talking to you for a much, much longer time, but <laughs> yeah, it, it could turn into a, a marathon. But in um, four weeks to finish, yeah, you you talk about you know it's a it's a great book, you know, one of the best writing books, especially if you want to be prolific and get shit done. Yeah. You talk about keeping ideas simple. <laughs> yes. Okay. Why? Okay. Now. Lately, my ideas go from being really, really simple to really complicated to really simple again. <laughs> yeah. Why? The, that's the key for you? you know, keeping the idea simple so you can get it written as fast as possible? It's, it's so you can get it written as fast as possible. So you're not overcomplicating things and putting yourself in a situation where like, you know, oh, well, now I have to completely invent some hyperdrive system and explain it all and blah, 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 or create an entire new magic system. Yep. Or, you know, if you want to do that, do that. Every author, and I say that, I mean, if, if you're an author and that's what you want to do, you want to spend years diving into the minutia of your universe and world and build it all up and you have it there, go for it. If that's your thing, do it. If you want to be prolific, <laughs> you're, you can't do that because that means you're spending years world building and not novel building. <laughs> um, so there's, there's A, you, you keep it simple so you can be prolific and write fast. It also, in a way, helps distill that idea down into its most perfect form. Um, once you start adding stuff onto it, it gets messy, it gets gooky and yeah. all that. If you've, if you've attacked the novel and attacked the idea in its simplest form, you always have that kernel there that you can go back to and go, you know, I have strayed. This is what it is. It's not this, it's this. I need to get back to that. I need to strip some of this out. I need to, I've been, I've been straying and getting complicated and you keep it simple then you can get it done because it's, you know, A, you're not complicating it yourself. B, you, you have that focus, that, that beautiful kernel. And that is going to come out in the writing. That's going to come out in the story. It's going to help push things on. You know, it helps with your plot. It helps with your character motivations. It helps with everything because it is just keep it simple, stupid kind of thing. You know, you're just, you get, you're, you're going to get muddy. You're going to get messy. You're going to get crazy. As soon as you start complicating it, you're going to forget things. You're going to blah, 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 blah. Simple, 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 simple. Um, yep. Will help actually, in my opinion, create a better novel, a better product, a better book. And the reader is going to feel that. Yep. They're going to latch on. If you have that beautiful little simple kernel, that's what they're going to hang on to. And that's what's going to drive them forward reading it all it's going to be their little guide that they can keep with them through one book two books three books the whole series whatever it is um so there's there are a lot of reasons to do it not just to be prolific but also so that you have a purity of story purity of character and it's going to help grab that that reader um also, in a way, it helps you describe it later on <laughs> yep. when you're done with the novel <laughs> and that dreaded synopsis and, you know, description time comes. You're like, no, this, this, was, this was the kernel. I mean, like, dead mech, very simple. It's far future. <laughs> it's, it's a far future zombie apocalypse. 
with, you know, with mech battle robots in there that asks this question, what happens if a human pilot dies in their mech? It becomes a dead mech. Boom. That's it. Everything else is gravy. You just have to stick, stick to that and remember that. And same with Zeburbia was what happens if there's a zombie apocalypse but the homeowners association <laughs> refuses to give up control <laughs> even though it's a zombie apocalypse what happens then um so in a way you can say that kernel can always be that original what if question you asked yep. yourself when you first came up with the idea go back to that what if um you know what if this oh yeah that's right that's what i'm writing <laughs> what if that okay i got away from that didn't i <laughs> but oh, yeah. um yeah Oh, yeah, so, um, yeah. No, go ahead. <laughs> I was just going to say because I, 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 you know, in Australia we're taught the you know the keep it simple, stupid method. Yeah. We're taught that, and I try to you know do it all the time. And I hit upon the perfect way of keeping you know that kernel of idea for my latest work in work um, in progress. The title is the idea. Yeah. You know, and, and when like every every person I've told the idea to, they always laugh like a child just because of how simple it is. And it's this zombie Nazis on a train. There you go. <laughs> I'm getting simpler than that, can you? <laughs> oh, that's awesome. There, perfect. <laughs> See, yeah, you giggle yeah. too. Everyone, everyone giggles to just goes, so, so, you know, I've had a couple of other authors just say to me, oh, you bastard, that's the best title ever. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Yeah, exactly. And you don't need to complicate it from there. And I, I, I I totally get get that. Um, I've had a couple titles. I love coming up with titles, and I've had a couple titles that I've changed later, um, just because the title was again the idea. Yep. And then when I finish the novel, and I'm like, oh yeah, so I'm going to call it this. Oh yeah, that's not a very good title anymore. <laughs> it's a great idea now that I've written the book. This is a better title for the book. Okay, we'll slap that on there. That's a great title. You know, stay with stay with that. Oh, I, um, I, <laughs> thank you, thank you. Um, I'm, I'm I'm gonna I'm gonna use that as a blurb quote. You know, that's a great title. Stay with it, Jake Bible. <laughs> <laughs> Who cares how the book is? The title's awesome. Yeah, um, yeah. But there there's even there's there's a um, and this this isn't singular to this story, but there's uh, I believe it's Charles Band who did Full Moon Studios. Um, the movie production company that yep. made Trancers and, and Puppet Master, which uh-huh. is, of course, a classic. Um, he was notorious for coming up with titles and actually having posters produced before a single word had been written, before anyone even knew it was going to be a movie. He created movie posters first, slapped them on his wall, called a writer in and said, make that. Oh, yeah. And the writer's <laughs> like, okay. <laughs> I'm going to do it. And honestly, the majority of the time, that poster ended up being the cover of the v- you know, VHS tape yep. or actually being the movie poster. And what was inside may not have a whole lot to do with that poster. The only time that that did align was dolls. Yeah. Because um, yeah, and- you've got, you got the poster with the little doll with the holding her eyes out and Stuart Gordon made it and he said, okay, I'm going to have a seat. I'm going to put that image in the movie. <laughs> yeah, it, 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 exactly. And, you know, some of them, the directors or the writers would be able to be like, okay, this is the poster. I got to figure out how to put that in there. <laughs> but I think as Full Moon grew <laughs> or got diluted, if you will, <laughs> they started making more and more movies but not spending their budget overall in the company wasn't exactly more. They just got smaller pieces for all of them. I, I think that at that point was definitely like, okay, well, that's great. That's the poster, but that's not the movie. This is what we're making. <laughs> but oh, yeah. as it is, you know, book covers sell books, movie posters sell movies. So all they care about is just getting that revenue in, in the beginning and then let everybody sort it out later and go, wait, that didn't have anything to do with this. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. As you said, no one in publishing and no one in Hollywood knows how to make a bestseller or how to have make a hit. <laughs> no, there's so many factors that, that go into that, that it's, it's insane. Oh, yeah. And I mean, I'll say I've been lucky. I've had, um, you know, some series that have, have hit 
well enough that, um, you know, I could call this a career. Um, but I do emphasize the word lucky. It's, yeah. it's, if you're going to have a hit, it's having the right book at the right time. Definitely. So it's, it's, there are plenty of books out there that have been huge hits that um, are crap. I mean, they're just, it's just crap writing. That's all there is to it. Um, and it's just because at that moment, people were looking for crap. They, they really, honestly, readers wanted that crap and they got it. Yeah. And, you know, so it's having the right book at the right time is, is how you really define success in publishing. <laughs> yeah. But I hope, I hope some of my crap hits then. <laughs> ah, yeah, it will. You just keep doing it. It's, you know, my motto is you can only fail if you quit. Yep. Um, so you, you keep slogging along and you keep doing it. And eventually, and this is the thing, unfortunately, the mythology of the author and mythology of the novelist, the mythology of the writer has influenced so many other writers and the general public that it's done a disservice to writing. Um, yep. Because people think, oh, if I don't have my first, you know, big seller by the time I'm 25, then I'll never make it. And it's like, you have no idea how many iconic, iconic novels were written by writers in their 50s, in their yeah. 60s, or their very first novel. They didn't write it until they'd retired from a career of whatever. Um, you know, it's it's if you really get into the history of publishing and the history of writing, you're going to find as many of those stories as you are of the overnight, you know, young success that, you know, I have my big hit. Now I'll be a bestseller forever. You know, that. It's, and then they no. fade, they fade into the ether and never yeah. heard of again. <laughs> keep, keep at it. Keep at it. Keep at it. Um, <clears throat> a friend of mine, Beth Revis, she's New York times bestseller. Um, wrote a young adult uh, sci-fi romance um, that, you know, I guess, yeah, romance. Well, you don't really have to say romance. It was a, it was a YA novel at the time, so it had to have romance. Yeah. Um, but it's a great sci-fi series. That was her 10th novel. Wow. She had written over 10 years. She, she wrote, is basically a novel a year writer. Over 10 years, she had written 10 novels, sent them out, rejected rejected yep. got went to it was like fine i'm gonna write another one send it out rejected it wasn't until that 10th novel that an agent said yes mm -hmm. and it happened to be the perfect timing because it was a ya and it was right during the huge ya boom she was instant new york times bestseller <laughs> and boom but it took her 10 years and it was literally what was this is the fun part literally the last novel she was going to write she said this is Whoa. it if this doesn't hit, I'm done. I'm gonna just, she's a teacher. She's a high school teacher. She's like, I'm just gonna focus on teaching. I'm not gonna write anymore. Um, so in a way her luck was that that one hit because yeah. <laughs> otherwise she would have quit. But it's also the perfect example of, you know the only way you fail is if you quit because she, she kept going. I mean, 10 novels, 10 novels full novels <laughs> all of that work everything and then all of that heartbreak after you know nine yeah. punches to the gut and soul she still kept going and that 10th one hit so yeah there you go that's that's inspiring <laughs> yeah definitely it, it it's kept me going over you know, at times where i'm like uh this one doesn't hit. I'm done. I'm done. No, I'm not done. You got to keep going because it's not in my control. So, and I mean, go. and and my my dad said this about me, and I think it's for certain with certain people that you have that thing of you've just got to do it. You've just got to create. You can't work a boring, well, not boring, but you can't work a regular day yeah. job. You have for some reason you just have that thing of I've got to create. I've got to do it no matter what. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. I, I am a storyteller. Um, and in fact, I, I really should put that on my business cards instead of writer novelist. It should be storyteller because honestly, I don't care what medium I tell a story in. It's yeah. one reason I'm looking at video games. Um, I just want to tell the story and I can't I can't not be a storyteller. I've been one since I was little. You know, some people call me a liar, whatever. I'm just telling a story here. See, yeah. that's the thing. 
one of my my best friend back in Australia, he said to me, get your business cards made up, you know, RF Blackstone. Don't put brighter, don't put storyteller, just put professional bullshitter. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Totally. Uh, but I love, yeah, I love telling stories and I love creating. Um, and when I had, you know, my day job and, and was doing that, one of the great things about that job was I was able to create products and yeah. I was able to create things and come up with stuff. Part of the moron aspect of it was <laughs> that I was like this, we should do this. Now nah, we're not going to do that. No, I don't think you understand. We really <laughs> should do this. This is a great idea. It's going to be big. You know, it's, you know, it was scratching that, that creation itch for me, but I also was like, Hey, no, I I've spent years in publishing, I understand how to analyze markets. I've been in sales forever too. I was like, no, this is going to hit. No, nah, now nah, we're not going to do that. <sighs> okay. And what, lo and behold, like a month later, a competitor does the exact same thing. And said. I'm like, <laughs> oh, but if anything, it just reinforced the fact that I'm a storyteller. I'm a creator. That's what I am at my core. Yep. doesn't matter what job I have. <laughs> I'm going to always tell stories or bullshit. <laughs> it's always going to happen. So now in that, in that spirit, what's, what's, what, what have you got coming out in the near future? Do you have anything coming out in the new future? Um, near future in the next couple months? Yes. I um, had my Kaiju Winter Series with Severed Press. Uh, we ended it on book three on a massive cliffhanger. Yeah, I, 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 um, yeah read it hated the cliffhanger called you a bastard for three weeks straight because of that <laughs> oh yeah no it was it was awful because i was expecting to go right into kaiju 4 <clears throat> the kai yeah that third book the sales were so bad that i couldn't even as much as i wanted to could not justify writing the fourth book yeah. um it would be like just writing a novel and just giving it away for free putting it out there and just be like here you go there, you know, all this hard work of building this series and nothing. So it was mutual. Myself and Sever, we decided we're not going to do the fourth book. Pissed a lot of people off, I, you know, over as time came back. Well, I got the rights back to the Kaiju series. So I'm writing the fourth book. And I'm not going to release the series until I release it complete. Okay. Because that was the number one thing I also found. As you find out about niches and genres and fandoms and all of that, Something I found out about kaiju lovers is they hate cliffhangers more than anyone in the world. Oh, yes. And they will hunt you down and tell you how evil you are for doing that. And I also found they it's a genre where a lot of the readership does not want to wait for the next book. Even if they know the next book is coming, they do not. They get very mad. <laughs> so i've learned that the only way this is going to be successful is if i release it complete all four books out there so that's the next project um novel wise as i'm in the middle of writing the fourth novel as i'm recording the audiobooks for the other three novels um so it, kind of my day is split you know yeah. early early recording so that my voice is fresh <laughs> um and then write you know in the afternoon sort of thing. And that's, that's kind of what my days are, are made up of. So let's see, it's probably going to be at least about three months before that's all out, okay. just because the amount of recording yeah. and you know, narration I have to do. Plus I have to finish the fourth novel, get it to the editor. Um, Cause I have to hire an editor and, you know, have it proofread and make sure everything's right and good. So that's going to take some time. Then it's going to be, you know, when I, when I release it, I want to release it kind of all at once, mm -hmm. um, which unfortunately audible takes about 30 days to approve novels to audiobooks. Yep. Um, so no matter what, when it's all finished, all done, and I press the button, it's I got still... about 30 days to wait. So instead of trickling it out, I'm going to, wait to boom launch it when audible says these have been approved i hit the button on everything else and then make the announcement that it's all out there okay. and then it is what it is and no one can at least get mad at me for not finishing the series it's finished <laughs> whether they like the ending or not that's a whole other thing but 
it'll at least be finished. So yeah, that's going to probably be about three months. Okay. All right. Ready. All right. Cool. Okay. So wh where can all, you know, all your fans or everyone who watches, they can find you Facebook, Twitter, Substack, you said? Yeah. Yep. Yeah. And jakebible.com, my website is, is the easiest place to start. Um, it has links to everything else. Yep. Um, it, you know, the jakebible.substack.com is my podcast and newsletter. Um, but there's links to that on my website. So yep. really jakebible.com that's that pay attention to that, but then go subscribe, click the link and subscribe to that newsletter too. That that's, you get all the news right away uh, instead of being like, you know, it is. Hey, uh, Oh, I wonder what Jake's Bible's doing. I'll go check, you know, and be four months late to the party. Come on, be, be part of the party when it happens. So yeah. <laughs> it's honest, I'm subscribed to your Substack, and yeah, it's a good party. <laughs> oh, well, thank you. I appreciate it. <laughs> When you when you set up your Substack and you sent out the initial because I was on your original newsletter and you sent that out, I went instantly. Oh, okay, he's getting rid of his newsletter and doing this. Fine, subscribe. <laughs> and, you know, so thank you so much for being on. Uh, oh yeah, coming thank on. You. I mean, I would love to keep talking, but I know <laughs> I, I get the thing that if this could turn into a three four hour kind of scenario, and you know, yeah. I, I I don't want to I don't want to take up too much of your your time, but. I would love to have you back on at some point. <laughs> yes, definitely. Let's 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 definitely do that. We will, you know, make make the um, commitment right now to do it again. Awesome. Um, yeah, I'm, <laughs> I'm a talker. I mean, you know, other than writing, my my job has been in sales. So, yeah, we could go on for hours. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and I mean, I have to talk for my day job. So yeah, and I worked in sales in Australia as well. So yeah, that's the. <laughs> there you go. And because nice. it's it's going to be on the internet, it's going to be there forever. So, you know, if Perfect. I invite if I invite you back on and you say no, I'm going to say well, <laughs> <laughs> exactly. No, I I've already committed to a sequel. So there we go. <laughs> and let's hope hopefully it's not going to take you. You know, how many years was it between Kaiju Three and Kaiju Four? <laughs> Wow, quite a few years. <laughs> so let's hope it doesn't take that long. <laughs> no, definitely not. <laughs> Thank you again so much, Jake. <laughs> oh, yeah. Thank you for having me. I appreciate it. It's a blast. Awesome. Catch you later. <laughs> yeah, you too. Thanks. And once again, a massive thank you to Jake Bible for being on the show. If, you're, if you want to follow Jake or buy his books, all the links are in the description below. If you like the video, please naturally like it share with you all your friends um please if you're enjoying if you enjoy this subscribe to the channel for updates about when new new interviews are released and if there are any particular authors or questions you'd like to you know any particular authors you would like to have have me interview please put it in the comments once again thank you very much for watching